It is difficult to believe three entire decades have passed since the celebrated year of 1991. Here in the U.S., it was a hangover of sorts from a 10-year stretch of excess and irreverence fondly known as the 1980s. Back in 91, the world experienced a wind-down of the Persian Gulf War. We were enjoying the O.J. Simpson reprisal of the beloved lawman Nordberg in the cinematic sequel to The Naked Gun alongside Leslie Nielsen. The capabilities of Al Gore's genius invention of the internet was only in its infancy. Furthermore, 1991 saw the release of an exceptionally large quantity of celebrated popular music recordings. A few of these very well-received recordings include Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 by Guns N' Roses, Out of Time by R.E.M., Diamonds and Pearls by Prince, Death Certificate by Ice Cube, Octung Baby by U2, Bad Motorfinger by Soundgarden, Emotions by Mariah Carey, and Metallica's self-titled Black Album, just to name a few. The impressive list goes on and on. There are many observers and musical academics who consider 1991 just as meaningful as another absurdly historical year, 1967. It is truly remarkable that three of 1991's most enduring recordings were released on the exact same day. Tuesday, September 24th, 1991. On this episode of Five Dollar Buzz, we examine them in great detail. Nevermind by Nirvana, The Low End Theory by A Tribe Called Quest, and Blood Sugar Sex Magic by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So please, lock the door behind you, adjust the towel, take your seat, and politely hit the fan setting to on. You're walking in on a 90s nostalgia session of Five Dollar Buzz. <laughs> Well, hello, folks. We're back here in the uh, $5 buzz. Thank you, George, for that wonderful cold open. I wanted to uh, add a couple albums, you know, Loveless by My Bloody Valentine, uh, Massive Attack. I forget the name of the damn album. That was a huge album at that time, too, that year. It was, I mean, it was, it was, it was all over the place. And uh, I don't think you mentioned, was Metallica's Black Album that year? I did mention yes, it. Was. Yep, it was. Oh, yeah, you said it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it was definitely a time, a change. It's when I had moved to San Francisco from Los Angeles, moved up with a bunch of my friends and things were a lot more different looking at that time. And, you know, it was I was turned 23 four days before these three albums we're about to discuss dropped. And it was and for me in particular, and you guys are about 10 years younger than me, roughly, except for Kevin. <clears throat> about my age. So two of us are right around the same time. And the two of you are about 10 years younger. So. But I think it equally had an impact on all four of us. Definitely all of those albums, um, as well as all the other ones that were briefly mentioned. So we'll just get into it. The three albums that we're going to discuss tonight are Nevermind by, uh, of course, uh, Nirvana. Uh, the Low End Theory by A Tribe Called Quest. And the last one is Blood Sugar Sex Magic by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, all various uh, for Nirvana and um, Tribe Called Quest, it was their second studio album to be released. Um, for Tribe Called Quest, it was on an independent label Jive. For <coughs> Nirvana, it was on Geffen, and uh, help, and I'll get to that in a second. And the Chili Peppers were newly minted on Warner Brothers. We'll talk about that. So it was September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety one, and away we go we'll start with nirvana and their album never mind 1991 an album called bleach had come out only two years prior uh, with a band that i saw open up for sonic youth at the palladium theater and i remember when after the show none of us knew who that band was but afterwards we all knew who the fuck that was and we went out to toxic shock records which was a famous record store in uh um, the Inland, Inland Empire, in the beginning of the Inland Empire, just on the outskirts of uh, the Los Angeles County, and that went every day looking for the S album Bleach that supposedly was coming out. And the only way you got that information then, of course, was a zine or a Spin magazine or something like along those lines. That album came out, and I played that motherfucker until the grooves wore off. I mean, the lo-fi six hundred dollar album was 
you know, for those of us who listened to it, it was Nirvana <laughs> in all senses of the word. So come a couple years later, I'm driving down to San Diego. I'm working at Amtrak and um, I'm just about to move to San Francisco. Uh, and the song plays on the radio and they said, it's by Nirvana. I said, what? And it was, you know, it smells like teen spirit. And lo and behold, goddamn, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it didn't sound anything like their prior record. It was well produced. It was polished, but it slammed. You didn't hear anything. Nothing like that sounded like anything on pop radio or even on any AOR you know, uh, radio, uh, radio labels, radio stations. And it, it was like immediately I went and bought the record and fucking played that song about 100 times before I went on to the rest of the album. So that album was produced by Butch Vig. They found him. Um, see, they found Butch uh, after looking for. They didn't want a producer that sounded like anybody else, or and that was a big name producer that was going to take points and be kind of an asshole about it. So uh, Butch was in a band at the time. Um, I forget the name of the band. It wasn't Garbage yet, but it was. A, it was another band, a really lo-fi band. Uh, Killdozer was what it was, and they just. They, they went to it, got in the studio here in Van Nuys, recorded uh, almost the entire album, save for uh, Polly, which was pre-recorded at a different time or a different location up in uh, Olympia, Washington. Um, the album, uh, they wanted it to sound, uh, he was heavily influenced at the time by the likes of the Pixies. Um, Trump Lamond also came out in 1991. That was probably his single most, of Kurt Cobain's most uh, biggest inspiration at the time were the Pixies, R.E.M., the Smithereens of all bands, and the Melvins, uh, another Seattle band uh, that he had grew up with, lived in a refrigerated cardboard box on Dale Crover's porch, the drummer for the Melvins at one point. So they get in there, and he just wanted to make a record that was, sounded like that had the mainstream fusion of the knack and the basic rollers with heavier bands, which is Black Flag and Black Sabbath, um, which is that you know age old term of what grunge is that synthesis of sort of you know heavy metal and punk, you know, and, and infused with a certain pop element to it, and pretty much is considered a cornerstone of the grunge genre. Now you could look at grunge and roll your eyes today, but at the time it was simply a term that hadn't been commodified to the nth degree. It is because of this album that you all of a sudden had bands that would never have ever, ever been on a major label get gobbled up in a bidding war frenzy because this album was not intended to be a hit. Geffen had no idea it was going to be a hit. Smells Like Teen Spirit was not intended to be. It was supposed to be the rollover song and Come As You Are was supposed to be the one that brought everybody in. They did not and weren't prepared and had no marketing element behind the release of Smells Like Teen Spirit when that came out four days prior to when the album dropped. They had no clue that it was going to literally bomb the system. You got to remember, this album came from a band who was living, you know, out of, a, like I said, in cardboard boxes. And the next thing you know, at the height of um, Nevermind Selling Power, was selling 300,000 albums a week for about six months. That is like an astronomically huge amount of records sold. I think only, you know, uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot of records. It wasn't their debut album, but the biggest debut album. Of course, George could talk about that, which is Guns N' Roses. Uh, so, you know, they, they did this album and all these songs are, based upon his relationship with Bikini Kill drummer Toby Vale. Toby Vale and him, you know, the fact the song Smells Like Teen Spirit was written on the wall, Kurt Smells Like Teen Spirit, and they were referring to the deodorant for women. <laughs> and he thought it meant a rebel yell for the teen generation, and it's angst-ridden. So there is, you know, a certain naivete in... in um, sincerity in Kurt, Kurt Cobain even though he's not nearly as intelligent he's an artist, he's not a genius let's just put it that way, there's a difference, right he's a genius artist, not a genius intellect, shall we say those two things don't always have to meet um, he was never an accomplished guitar player, but when he played the guitar, he made it fit the song and uh, was very emotionally driven, like a lot of uh, blues players 
Anyway, you want to step in? I can just keep going. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, do you think that when they recorded um, that album and that song, because I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, as I understand it, it was a fairly short process. It didn't, they not, they banged that album out pretty quickly. He I wouldn't think. do more than three cut. He, he would never do more than three takes as a singer. Not more. Oh, there's only one. Know that. There was only one song. He had to be convinced that John Lennon would do over Tebs with his vocals to get a fourth take on two of the songs, which Vig had to uh, uh, had to fake or trick Cobain uh, by saying that now nah, we fucked this up. We need to fix that. In fact, he got so during the process of seeing of, of recording the song "Drain You," I believe. And you got he got Cobain got so frustrated they ripped into a song that they um had been doing on the side and Butch Vig pressed record and that is the song Endless Nameless, which is the track at the very end of the album. If you had the CD, it's the one after um uh it's on the something same track, in the way. something in the way, ten minutes and thirty four seconds later. That I thought that was Polly that was that song that was so far later. No, no, Polly's in the middle. Oh, track five. It's been a while, but what, yeah. I'm, what I'm what I'm asking though, what I'm trying to get at is that: Do you think that once when that song happened after this, or it smells like Teen Spirit, for example, happened, and they let's say they did two or three takes of it, do you think they all knew? Everybody in the room knew that that was a powder keg, like that that was just dynamite. I mean, because I I think even I remember as a kid, I was probably in um. I don't know, sixth grade. And I remember this kid named John Smith walking around and he had a um, speaker, you know, a tape player on his shoulder. And I, the first time I'd ever heard it and he looked at me like I was an asshole because I'd never heard of it before or yet, but he was walking around listening to it and it was instantly, I mean, I was like, what is that amazing sound? You know, do you think they knew that no. when, they, when they were doing it? No, not even a bit. In fact, I mean, he was so, he had such disdain for the song after it became huge that he simply took it off the playlist <laughs> either sets later on. He refused to play it. He changed the lyrics, garble the guitar, fucking strangle it. He hated it. He said something I would in the way it. is an amazing song off that album too. Oh something, something in the way, way is an amazing song. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh it's a fictionalized version of him living underneath a bench, which he did not. I said he lived in the cardboard box. And it's you know meant to evoke a sort of spiritlessness uh in himself during that period but it's not necessarily taken for fact as many people have tried to give it accordingly you know the the album went on to unparalleled heights you know they joined the tour with um red hot chili peppers uh oddly enough as the second band and with the, when the band was chili peppers went on the road with the smashing pumpkins for blood sugar sex magic and then they wanted Nirvana and really Corgan Corbin wouldn't play because he also used, used to date Courtney Love. So that caused friction. So exit Smashing Pumpkins, enter Nirvana. Within two months of that tour, Nirvana's headlining everything. Interesting, so, um, interesting parallel between uh, the Chili Peppers, though, and Nirvana in that situation is that their prior album, Nirvana's Bleach and the Chili Peppers' Mother's Milk, were both just like that surface scratching surface and then this their, their that following album is what i mean exploded both bands into another world or i mean unless you would think that bleach did that for nirvana but i actually i mean i think we can all say it met, the, it, it met the masses with never mind I the chili peppers right. were los angeles band so they had already you know with their first eponymously named album then funky freaky styly uplift mofo party plan and then Mother's Milk, and then their, uh, I think it's their fifth album, not their seventh album, is the yeah. uh, uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. So they, the other four, uh, most of them were done by Michael Beanhorn, the producer. We'll get in that in a minute. Mm. But I think that those albums, um, you know, reflected the sort of anarchy of the Chili Peppers. So they already had a big following. They they were everywhere. Nirvana, you know, they didn't have a following. Even with Bleach, it was still small. Like I said. When Kim Gordon introduced Sonic Youth, introduced them to uh, David Geffen uh, to get on Geffen Records because Geffen had signed Sonic Youth, oddly enough, before that, um, that had 
repercussions that nobody understood, including Kim Gordon. All they wanted to do was sell as many records as Sonic Youth's previous album, Goo, had sold. That's, mm. that was the, that was the uh, that that was what they were focused on. That was what they were hoping to do is just sell that many records, and they eclipsed that by you know I, I don't even know they just wanted to sell two hundred fifty thousand. They started doing that in a week. Yeah. Um. Again, nobody understood. You know, and you're going to get to that when you talk about the Chili Peppers is a band struggling with this crisis of identity and who you are, and the music you play versus the fame you capture. And I know that's an age old thing, but so many of those superstars back in the day really wanted it, you know, and I, I, Cobain probably did, too, on some level. But Chris Novoselic didn't. And, you know, and when Chad Channing, the drummer originally for Chili Pepper for uh, the Nirvana had left, in fact, there's only one song that he is on that is Polly. He does the symbols and he doesn't get credited for being on the song. Um, but the, uh, when Dave Grohl came in, you know, they found their drummer I, again. It, it coalesced. They created something. It wasn't anything that quite existed in the mainstream. A lot has to do with the music video that, that also just carried them forward. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, even all these other legendary albums that we mentioned in the upfront, you know, some of those were by big bands at that time. And some of those were big because they were big in the UK. You know, this was something that became worldwide. Nirvana hit the entire world. And yeah. You know what the thing is, man? Uh, I, well, you know, when I think about, I was in, in 1991, I was in ninth grade. So I was a freshman in high school. So I was kind of like at the right place at the right time. Yeah. for a lot of this stuff and uh i don't know one thing about i i really like nirvana i really like this record a lot and i really think the unsung hero of the record roger is uh chris novoselic mm-hmm. i really like the way he plays the bass i think it really propels a lot of the songs um and i remember there was this guy i used to work with who uh, really loved nirvana and I remember I was with him the day when Kurt Cobain died. So I was just around. This guy was a huge fan. And like, what's the, what do you really like about these guys? Like, what's so cool? Because it took me a little while to get into Nirvana. And he's like, for three, three guys just kicking ass. And that always stuck out with me because there was only three of them. And Dave uh, Grohl, who I'm not the hugest fan of, his, his, and he's not the greatest drummer in the world from like a f- technical like standpoint, but his velocity is so fucking hard on this album. And it's really at odds with the way he plays the drums on uh, the MTV unplugged record, which is very subtle. And uh, And he just does it. You want to know what that was? Those drums were heavily manipulated in the recording process. Okay. Cause they sound so (laughs) loud. The drums are so loud on that uh, on nevermind. But yeah, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, Nova Selleck, you know, two of my favorite songs, my two favorite songs on this album are not one that most people think about are Breed. When, when I listened to this record the other day, I was like, this song is so fucking good. Breed. There's just so much energy. And a lot of that is Nova Selleck. And my other favorite song is uh, Lounge Act. And they're both bass heavy. And, you know, Cobain is singing with so much urgency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, about the videos, and I know we want, I want to let Kevin jump in here, but uh, I remember the In Bloom video was really cool because they were kind of doing like a, uh, wh- what was that old show? Uh, Ed Sullivan. That, yeah, yeah, it was like an Sullivan Ed show. Sullivan show. It was really cool. But uh, I don't know, man. I really think that Nirvana gets a lot of credit for, uh, you know, the music world changed almost overnight, not really overnight, but it felt like overnight. But, you know, I, I personally remember just seeing the Allison Chains video, Man in the Box, which is like a black and white video. And I just remember like, yo, there's something different about these guys. They're from Seattle. They're not from L.A. They're not wearing makeup. And like, I know Soundgarden was around. Jane's Addiction was around. And I don't know. I feel like Nirvana kind of gets a lot of credit and maybe... It's just like the easy uh, way for people just to kind of latch on to something and maybe make it to Avatar for the times and the sound. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I really like the album. I really like Nirvana. And uh, yeah, uh, Kevin, 
you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, well, 91, I was what, in my second year at Chico State. Um, those of you unaware, Chico's uh, about three hours north of San Francisco. I think a lot of people that aren't from the area, the only reason they have heard of it, because back in the day, it had such a party school rap that both Playboy and MTV kind of uh, perpetuated and added on to. But it's a great college town. And like most college towns, I would say, you know, it's a heavily, you know, there's a huge musical influence, whether it's just college bands or just that kind of the student population. And my memories of that time, and it's kind of just wonderful to think back on, you know, it's a college town. So basically you're riding your bike and uh, you're riding your bike through student, you know, residential student areas and you're always going to hear music, but it's, you know, it's kind of a rarity when you're hearing the same music every block. And at that time you could be sure that you're somebody was to be playing the Nevermind album. And then the chili peppers were, you know, huge, huge, huge student rotation back then. And uh, I, I can't remember who said it, but somebody was talking about uh, Exile on Main Street when the Stones put that out. And there's parts of New York City and people were saying, now, no matter where you went in the city of New York, that's the album that people were playing that you heard. And that's kind of how I felt back then in, in, co in college at Chico was just hearing those albums to the, almost to the point where I kind of, kind of turned off, I think, a little on Nirvana just because it was getting played by so many kids so often and you're kind of a uh, he hit, hit your enough already mode and i also had, at that point that's when you know it's kind of introduced to, to soundgarden and soundgarden was uh right up my alley and that's what i was kind of more leaning towards but just that time the music i mean i feel like every every week or so it seemed like there was a new band that you're kind of you know being exposed to. And I remember when you said the man in the box, Alice in Chains, I remember very clearly at that time, you know, seeing that for the first time and being exposed to the pumpkins, you know, initially. And it was just obviously a great, great time for music. Yeah, it was absolutely. And, you know, um, I always thought it was interesting, Pete and Roger, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's interesting that, you know, how Dave Grohl is kind of like, become this uh really savior i don't know what the right way to describe him is like this like champion of like uh the rock industry and chris novoselic is basically i couldn't even tell you what that guy is up to these days and he doesn't really he's kind of really stepped away it's kind of interesting how these two guys paths have uh diverged and which makes perfect sense if you knew yeah. both, if you knew who both of them were you know, uh, Chris Novoselic was just a, you know, he said like he was a punk rock hippie, you know, and just that's how I define myself sometimes. And, yeah, you know, he was just as happy playing music with his best friend, Kurt Cobain, as he was, you know, hanging out and growing stuff, you know, being a, a you know, a, a nature, a naturist. Um, he uh, on the on the other conversely, you know, Dave Grohl was a lot more opportunist and ambitious and bled that into a band that has uh, had more records than Nirvana, still hasn't sold as many records as Nirvana, collectively even. But Does uh, he ever do any Nirvana songs? Yeah. Is that course, what he yeah, yeah of yeah. course he did. Yeah. yeah. The ones that he's able to. <laughs> you know, but the, um, the thing is there is that, you know, Grohl... It's this touchy thing. Grohl is the nicest guy you'll ever meet, but he also like there's something about him I can't put my finger on because I don't know him well enough beyond those the few times I've met him that I can't you know that I haven't been able to. You know, I just know people that work with him. Other people say he's just the nicest guy in show business. That's you know it's like something's lurking underneath there. His music uh, is not nearly as, and he would be the first one to tell you. Yeah, I think I it's hard. I think it's. I don't hard. write music as good as Kurt Cobain. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the guy's heart's in the right place. Like he did that documentary uh, series about these recording studios, and I remember I really liked all the episodes he did, except for the part when, like, the very end was like, "Now here's my video with Joe Walsh," 
or here's my video with uh, whoever else was in the, maybe I want to say like Tom Petty might've been in the, in the, in the, in one of the episodes, but uh, sound yeah. studio. Yeah. Yeah. The Peter. traveling, the traveling sound studio uh, tour that he did for HBO. That was it. Pete, any uh, thoughts, well, closing thoughts on that or any thoughts yeah. on uh, the Foo Fighters or any of that? We jazz? can, we can, we can wrap it up with the, with the never mind. But I mean, you know, the thing about Dave Grohl, I think, is that um, he had that. He has. He's probably. He probably would have been a good Chili Pepper. Those guys all have great work ethics. They kept on cranking out albums. They kept on doing the thing by the studio. They kept on making money, and they were good. You know, after Blood Sugar Sex Magic, I know we're not there yet, but I don't really care for much of the Chili Peppers, to be honest with you. But we're all gonna go there, I think. <laughs> but I mean, I think. Dave Grohl, as a member of Nirvana, probably had the work ethic of Anthony Kiedis and Flea. You know, uh, it's hard to say because uh, Kurt Cobain left us so early, but uh, would he have been more Nova Selleck or would he have been more Grohl? I don't even know, to be honest with you. You, you might think he's punk rock, but I just don't think you know. He did an MTV Unplugged, so, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't but know it what to very you know. It, it, it was probably this most special and most amazing one ever, and I don't doubt that at all, but who knows what, I mean, I don't know if they would have gone full Green Day, but, uh, you know, I think they would have made a couple more albums and I don't know. What makes it special is that they did only, it's like, you know, there's not a, there's a, the, the album title is not coincidental that it's also the beginning of the title of one of his favorite records, Never Mind the Bullocks, Here's the Sex Pistols. And mm -hmm. they only recorded one official record, but became legendary because of that one record. Mm -hmm. Nirvana, so you know, is legacy lives on mainly because of the that fact they did can, three out. Sorry to interrupt there, but uh, and the last thing I, I would would like to ask you guys uh, is like you know I, it seems like it's very fashionable now for like you see a lot of younger folks wearing the Nirvana T shirt and uh, you know a lot of people claim to be influenced by Kurt Cobain. You know one thing about Never Mind, it's just like. It's not a very accessible album. Like, do you ever find yourself at a party or some social event and say, hey, man, let's throw on Never Mind. It's, it's just more of an introspective uh, recording. And, and I just wonder, like, are people really getting into Nirvana, these younger folks? or is it, I see Nirvana t-shirts on kids. Everywhere. They're everywhere. I, I, I get all the time. But I'm just wondering, I, are know. they getting into songs like um, well, it's like we all, and, But when we were listening to that shit in the late 80s, you know, besides our Sonic Youth and Who's Do and Minutemen and Replacement shirts, we also had the Doors and the Who and, and Zeppelin shirts. And mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing. But we had, I mean, we had, we listened to those albums actively. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's not a dissimilar I like to think it's not dissimilar, you know, and hoping that they are influenced by, you know, something beyond the musical choices that they have surrounding them today. Yeah. Hey, look, man, I'm, I'm sure some 20 year old never heard of it before listens to that album for the first time. Their mind probably is blown compared yeah. to the stuff that they're used to hearing. So I yeah. would like to think that that album still has that kind of impact on people for the first that first that first listen you got from it. That was really incredible. You know, I hope there's so much happens. more I could have talked about, like the album cover and everything else. But. I think we can move on. I think it's enough to, to you know, show sort of where we're going with this episode. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, we are back from that quick little break. Uh, thanks for sticking with us here. We are about to move into uh, some cool territory with George, who has um, taken a little deep dive on a on an album from that same week. We're talking about September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety one, and the album is the Low End Theory by a tribe called quest which uh i mean i love this album i listened to it again and felt like for the first time the other day and such a just a fantastic album and uh i want to hear uh hear george george's thoughts on it. george tee it up let's talk about this thing yeah sure i appreciate that so yeah um just to reiterate the three records that the three albums that we're talking about today all came out on the same exact day um uh, roughly 30 years ago to the day. Uh, so this is a, tr a Tribe Called Quest second album called The Low End Theory. And it's uh, it's kind of coincidental where I mentioned, and I didn't mean this, that, you know, I never really 
put on a Nirvana record uh, in a social setting. But whenever I had some people coming over my house and, you know, I'm never quite sure what people's tastes are. And I try and find something right down the middle. And I find myself would always, when I had a, an iPod, I would put on the low end theory by a tribe called quest because it has this smooth vibe. It has kind of an uplifting positive vibe to it. And it has this really cool, um, jazz feel to it because a lot of uh the songs on the low end theory were either sampling some old jazz records or they had uh live bass playing by a famous jazz musician who was a bass player named uh, ron carter and hence the name the low end theory a lot of the songs were emphasized uh for the heavy bass sounds to it and uh as I mentioned previously, you know, 1991, I was a freshman in high school, so I would left junior high, the cozy confines of uh, junior high, into uh, high school. And, you know, almost immediately, right away, you could sense that the atmosphere was different. And not only was, um, to, you know, Roger's eloquent points about Nirvana, how the rock scene was changing the hip hop scene was changing. You know, I remember, and you guys probably do in the late eighties watching MTV, you know, rap was sort of like a novelty fun, you know, um, I want to say um, it wasn't taken that seriously. I don't think, but you know, obviously there were some serious rap groups out there like uh, KRS one and public enemy and, you know, probably NWA. But uh, Tribe Called Quest in 1991, they were doing something a little different, not only with the jazz sounds, because a lot of the West Coast bands were kind of sampling like uh, Parliament and George Clinton records. And they had these synthesizer sounds that you probably hear in like a lot of Dr. Dre's uh, album. They used to call it the G-Funk sound. But on the East Coast, they were doing something a little different. Uh, and Tribe Called Quest um, what and what and what struck i remember when they said they got ron carter to play on the record and he was a serious musician he's like you know this is a rap album and like i really don't want to be associated with something where there's going to be a lot of cursing or there's going to be a lot of uh you know promote you know what the media would call promoting violence and that record just doesn't have any of it i think i might have heard like three or four curses uh and there was no talk about violence and there was no there was none of all the um, stereotypes you, you might've heard back in those days where, you know, rap is a bad thing for kids to be listening to, or we're going to sticker these albums. You know, a lot of it was about positivity. A lot of it was about um, growth as a human. A lot of it was the song lyrics were about, you know, you know, celebrating life and um, you know, Q-Tip who was the main, uh, MC on the record was also the main producer on the record. So uh, there, I, I, you know, he's a very significant artist in the fact where he could make all the beats and rap at the same time. A lot of people can't do that. Maybe you think of like Dr. Dre or Kanye West or uh, the RZA from Wu-Tang who can actually make the beats, but also rap. So it's a, there's not that and Havoc from Mob Deep, who is another rap group from Queens that, uh, Q-Tip helped discover in a certain sense. He introduced those guys to the record label, but um, obviously they had a really cool video called Scenario. And at, I don't if you go back and look at it now, it kind of looks weird. But I remember seeing it for the first time. It was the first video I ever remember showing like Microsoft Windows, where they would kind of cut back and forth to the different artists, and that song also had uh, a relatively unknown artist uh, on the song called Buster Rhymes, who obviously is kind of a household name now because he was friends with the guys in the Tribe Called Quest. But yeah, it was a very positive record. It was very different from a lot of the other rap music that was being made at the time. And, uh, you know, um, it still sounds awesome. I really like the drums. I really like the rhyming. Uh, I the, the only small criticism I always have is like maybe it's a little too long, but um, you know the, the, I would say about uh, Nevermind and uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic as well is that 
even though these albums were made as compact discs, I think primarily in 1991, the vinyl was definitely on its way out. But all these recordings, I, it's hard for me to not listen to them in their entirety because I think they're all part of a big musical movement, almost like a symphony, like just to hear them one at a time. Yeah. Like it's cool to hear it smells like teen spirit or scenario or uh, under the bridge by red hot chili peppers on their own. But I think you lose something when you don't hear this stuff in their entirety. And I think that's probably uh, where the artists, the recording artists were coming from, uh, you know, music. I don't think any of these bands were, were like, setting out to make singles I, I think they wanted to make a piece of music uh, uh roger i know you spent some time uh listening to this record uh you have any thoughts on this one yeah i mean first I mean, <clears throat> the album's title was also referred to the status of black men in society at the time as well as the bass frequencies uh in the songs in the music um it features the album cover with a, a kneeling woman painted in afrocentric colors and it at the time was not considered uh, when it was released by Jive Records. They had no, oh, they, they really had no faith in the record. They thought it was not going to be good, um, just like, you know, Nirvana. And they had uh, a bit. There was a war going on within the band, you know, with that label and their lawyer and management. And they all jumped ship and joined uh, Russell Simmons. They jumped from cool DJ Red Alert. Uh, who was their manager and they fired everybody and surprisingly at the time and he was influenced specifically he says by nwa's record straight out of compton for maintaining that sort of lo-fi uh, recording structure you know and, and he did some things on this album there's uh one particular song and i can't remember exactly which one it was but it was there's one song where he has a a, a drum sound that's three different snares all layered on top of each other. Yeah, he that was one of his uh, techniques was layering the drum sounds. And, and that person would be Q-Tip, whom Q -tip. I don't think yeah. mentioned. You know, this, the band was Fife Dog and Q-Tip. Um, and there was a third member named uh, Ali Shaheed Muhammad, who wasn't really a rapper. He was more of a DJ and was a beat maker himself. But he's still pretty active, and he he's, he's still doing a lot of producing. Uh and, and another guy named Jerobi White. Yeah, Jerobi was on the first record, and then he kind of disappeared for a while. That's right. And then he came back on their latest album, and it's weird. He he had a, like a second career as a, like a chef in New York City somewhere. But um, well, uh, yeah. it's funny you say that because uh, uh, listening to it the other day, one thing I felt, you know, besides realizing that it was 1991, which if you had asked me prior, I probably would have put it later, like 94. You know, I just didn't know. But um, what's interesting about that time is that it's patently New York City sound, if you think about it. You got, you know, you've got that Chili Peppers LA sound and you've got that Nirvana Seattle sound. But this is an album that, yeah, it's a jazz and, and hip hop, you know, hybrid in some respect. But it's, it's a New York City sound, which That's I think funny. is really, really cool about listening to, you, you know, you, feel, you really feel like you're walking around the city if you just listen to it and uh so i thought that was some some, some kind of an emotion uh in motion that was evoked after listening to it again and, and that, yeah. that jazz yeah go ahead that textural that textural jazz aspect to it which is also you know very prevalent in the chili peppers blood sugar sex magic is a huge jazz influenced um album in its own right so something was in the water in those <laughs> that year obviously yeah, and uh, to your point, it's it's a really smooth album, and I think that there's a really nice uh, contrast between Q-Tip's voice, who does have this like quintessential New York accent, you know, and uh, Fife Dog has a really rest in peace. By the way, he passed away uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but um, he's got uh, a great. Uh, delivery he's got a great flow himself and roger you probably remember this but um of all people michael rapaport made a documentary about yep. tribe called quest and rhymes and rhythms before like michael rapaport is you know he's kind of had like a third life now as like an internet instagram celebrity but i thought that movie was pretty well done 
yeah, it, it, play, it played Sundance. It was a big hit. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, and just think about you know how influential the album was. Just like my bloody Valentine's Loveless made everybody start to sort of play this guitar through uh, almost like a gigantic pedal, which was a synthesizer. You know, this album, you know, a lot of bands started utilizing that technique, particularly in England, that this band, you know, this jazz rap or, you know, as they call it, influenced uh, another equally great band from Brooklyn a year later, which was Diggable Planets. I mean, I don't don't think you get one without the other, you know, uh, particularly Diggable Planets without without this album breaking like it did. And again, this album was a small, slow seller that ended up becoming, you know, um, certified platinum, you know, by 1995. Yeah. George, what's, what's, uh, what's Wu-Tang Clan doing in 1991? I don't think, I think that RZA and uh, his cousin, Jizza, genius, they, I think they were standalone artists at the time and they had some uh, records out that like, I didn't even know about. I didn't really hear about Wu-Tang till like a two or three years later. And they kind of just like, so Ooh, it's wow. fair. It, it's fair to say that a tribe called Quest may have yeah. even trailblazed for that sound, that that epic New York sound that Wu Tang owns. I mean, we think yeah. we've been hungry forever in in time. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I always feel Wu Tang is just a whole other animal. Personally, it, it kind of is. is. Yeah, it kind of. Is. Hardcore. Well, they, you know what? Those guys like RZA and um, Q Tip. Hip hop. Those guys were, you know geniuses in the fact that like there was no internet in those days there was no shazam like these guys are sampling and looping records like this was never done before like these guys Mm -hmm. essentially created a new recording technique like q-tip would hear well it had had been i mean sampling been around since 1982 83 when that really started to hit and it was in the late 80s the public enemy been doing it way before that yeah they were but, you know, I would put Q-Tip and those guys and, you know, pioneers of using the... the M- more the, obscure more obscure samples, too. Or just like the technique was used, they use a sequencer called the, the MPC where they could trigger the drum sounds and they could record the loop of the record um, to make what a rap song essentially is now. So... But I think, Roger, the point I'm trying to make is that these like specific individuals, like they 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 had to go and find the record out of a crate in some like secondhand store, and they knew they they couldn't reference it on the internet. They just said, "I'm going to listen to this record. I like this, you know, two or four bar sample, and I'm going to put some drums on it, and I'm going to layer the drums." And you know, the the the, the tribe called Quest Records. They, Th- those drums that they sample are like analog drums. Those are like real humans playing it, not so oh, much yeah. as the digital music. They were, they were, they they were, they were experimental and influential in trying to recreate a, a live sound session in the background. I mean, you listen to the record loud, sounds like you're, you know, listening in a club. I mean, yeah. That was what they were, that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. And, and they, they mixed it all. On the Nev eight is it called Nev N E V E? You would know that George, an eight oh six eight mixing console, the exact same one that was used by John Lennon. There's a little bit of trivia there. Wow, and uh, yeah, Pete, just to you know, I think I think you know, uh, Tribe Called Quest is a very influential hip hop group, and you know the, that area of Queens was you know you had Nas, you had uh, Mob Deep, uh, Noriega. There was just a lot of artists from like this very small part of the world really right they're not these guys all kind of grew up near each other and their music became like uh, world famous really but uh yeah a lot of like it was called digging in the crates these guys would go and just find records sample them and then put the drums on them and uh you know, RZA from Wu-Tang was doing a lot of the same thing uh and Kev I don't know did did uh, Tribe do you remember hearing this out in California at all? I, I was, first of all, I'm really glad that you guys are, you know, we're acknowledging this band because I hadn't listened to this album. I can't remember the last time I listened to it. I listened to it today just to refresh myself and uh, brought back a lot of memories. But I think I had it, 
I didn't have it. I think a roommate of mine again in Chico, either him or his lady um, had this album and uh, maybe I'm asking who it was. And obviously it's, it's a, it's the name of a band that as soon as you hear it, you're not going to forget it. Um, and just enjoying it. And you know, there wasn't a lot of, it's not a lot of benefits of living with three other guys in college, but the, uh, you know, music and drugs are the, you know, kind of offset the, the dirty dishes. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I was fortunate enough to hear it back then, and and listen to it today. You can just kind of you, you can I can't, I couldn't even think of like a lot of the bands that it was reminding me of. But there's I feel like there's just so many bands that come after that you hear traces of of Quest in in them. You know, it's just uh, it, I mean, you know, so many musicians have said have, have credited it for influencing them, and you can you can hear it in so many other bands. Yeah, and. Um... One other thing that uh, I know we're going to talk about the Red Hot Chili Peppers record, but uh, during this time was kind of like the age of um, In Living Color or the Arsenio Hall show where a lot of these, you know, African-American artists kind of were getting some visibility and getting some, uh, you know, uh, spotlight that, you know, it didn't really happen. And I think that, you know, Tribe Called Quest was one of the pioneers of like, you know, they were getting out in the um, mainstream early. And uh, I think that, you know, their success uh, paved the way for a lot of uh, the, the, the groups that came after them. And yeah, Pete, to your point, it's, this was called the golden age of hip hop, like the early nineties East coast sounds with all those artists. And then you had on the West coast was like Dr. Dre, Tupac and all those guys making you know the sounds are very distinctly different and um it was just a great time for music and you know hip-hop in general you know despite Absolutely. tupac being from brooklyn <laughs> yeah he's from brooklyn baltimore then oakland you know yeah. but you know but george it's it's further proof to a thing that we've always said is that the music and and, and culture in general experienced a renaissance in art in uh, you know in the 90s in the early 90s you know in it's it, this is all just for, further proof you're talking about three albums that couldn't be more different and they're all they're they're out in the same week that's same the, day uh, that's same, the one, day. same day same these day. all three albums came out on the and a week later bad motor finger i think came yeah, out bad I mean, motor finger by uh, you know that's pretty pretty amazing pretty amazing stuff but as um, one reviewer said and particularly that time going back to nirvana really quickly what it was at that time was finally these this generation our generation x finally had been discovered by the mainstream we finally had something that we could hold dearly to our own that came from our you know creativity we no longer were a slave to the boomers and their their incredible buying power over the years and influence on you know what was the status quo and yeah it's it's uh you know th these t other two albums certainly help uh sort of change that shift that dynamic um, most definitely more and, equity. And, 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 the, and the low end theory again like you were saying george is the first really great rap record or hip-hop record that you know talked about relationships talked about date rape you yeah. know talked about consumerism you know mm -hmm. it was uh, social i mean you know outside of public enemy and weren't that and 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 uh, krs1 from boogie down productions there aren't that many that you can point to right at that moment um, that uh, expressly, you know, uh, embraced that sort of uh, uh, focus. They were definitely doing something different and they were definitely doing something cerebral. And it wasn't, you know, for uh, shock value or it wasn't, no. you know, trying to exploit uh, certain unfortunate uh, circumstances of uh you know, I guess like the black community uh, living in New York. They, 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 if you listen to the lyrics, it's it's really feel good and aspirational and hopeful and uh, celebratory, which was not really uh, the case for a lot of the records that were being made. And uh, I'm glad that it's really, you know, it, it was a successful record and it's still uh, really thought highly of, you know, to, to this day. So it's, uh, well, it's, it's, go ahead. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, though, on the on um, or maybe this is maybe this particular point is best saved for after or at the end here. But I mean, 
does 1991 how does it how does it stack up against say 1965 which i've heard you multiple times over the years we've known each other or reference george no i i think it well i would i always read about 1991 versus 1967 which 67. i don't have the list in front of me but i know that's the year of uh Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. I know Jimi Hendrix had a record. The Doors had a record. Uh, I don't know, man. I think we could do an, an episode of uh, do we as, the merits do, of both. But do we as Generation Xers own that that re, that that uh, rev, musical revolution of the same potency as the as the sixties? I mean, can people go back and say the early nineties were like that? That they had that same offering to culture same same paradigm shift in what people how people consumed music and what they consumed and what they liked you follow me yeah hey you gotta remember 1967 i experienced Jimmy sergeant pepper beatles velvet underground uh love the pipe was at the gates of dawn um israeli gears by cream acts as bold as love also Jimi hendrix the same year surrealistic pillow and that changed consumerism the way that we looked at the mall buyers, um, they weren't mall buyers then. But in that's quite a that's quite a roster. That that's, a just, ro- <laughs> dude, it, that's, but, a, that's a tough roster. To but dude, follow. so is you know Pearl Jam ten bad. Boy everything, finger, everything, you said, Nicole, yeah. everything you said, Everything you said, the cold open. Uh, it's 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 really tough, but um, um, yeah, I think it's just as significant, just as meaningful. I mean, a lot, you know with the, the grunge uh, or, or alternative. And I remember uh, Chris Novoselic said, they, they asked him about grunge. He's like, dude, isn't that something on your shower curtain? He's like, what does that even mean? But like, you know, the Seattle rock bands and, uh, you know, hip hop bands. I mean, that was, that was like a revo- revolutionary uh, sound that changed the recording industry. I mean, everything really change it, it was different man a lot of stuff changed but uh yeah i think it, it, it it's a very significant year man i mean kevin i don't know what you think no i mean it, it's certainly it, there's you, it, there's it's not a lot of times you can look back at history and see this kind of tectonic shift of of music and that is certainly one of them it's kind of funny because i was reading just reading a lot of different articles today about that time period and I saw one headline that I had to click on because the name of the article was basically how Nirvana ruined rock and roll. And I was curious to see what the, uh, what the angle was there. And the, this author, and I don't care who wrote it, um, basically his argument was that because Nirvana opened that door for punk rock or you know, punk pop rock, however you want to categorize it, because we always got to put a label on, on music, that uh, Nickelback and Creed were the two bands that this author cited that that they never would have gotten to where they did popularity wise, success wise, without Nirvana. <laughs> but you know, anytime there is a musical revolution, um, there's going to be there's going to be copycat bands and the Beatles going to have copycat bands that suck I balls. Mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, and I mean, I would always argue that Nickelback and uh, and Creed are a small price to pay for basically grunge, you know, completely killing and burying the the hair metal bands. And this is comes to my hair metal. And my first concert was uh, was Dude, Motley Crue. Still have so. fucking Radiohead because of Nirvana. So well, you know. it, it, exactly, it's like you know, it, it's a small price to pay to oh, kind of close the close the chapter on the eighties on the eighties music, which uh, which it certainly did. I think it was a member of Great White. It's one of those hair bands. I think it might have been somebody great wide that was a, kind of a famous interview where he says the first time he heard Nirvana and uh, Teen Spirit that he knew it was that over. they were done. It was, it was over. over. Yeah, it there, was, it there's was one I remember. End of hair metal. There was uh, the singer from uh, Warrant. His name was Janie Lane. And he's like, we were like the face of the, the, the record label. We were, we were out there killing it. We were doing this Cherry Pie song. And he goes, I remember coming back to New York to the headquarters uh, to talk about the next project. And he was, I walk in the, the lobby and there's this wall size poster of Alice in Chains dirt on the wall. And he's like, right then and there, he's like, this is over for us. 
He's like, I just I was like, this is over. And it was just like that. Vaporized. And, and you know what, George? Good fucking riddance. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, with, 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 with that being said, Pete, uh, would you like to uh, round out the conversation with the third <laughs> album from September 24th, 1991? Yes. Yes, I will. Um, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, you know, uh, is an album that we're all very familiar with. Myself, I have a personal connection to it. Uh, you know, I, I burned a hole in this tape. I loved it so much. It was one of the first tapes I ever got. I think my dad's girlfriend, Trudy, gave it to me as a, for, for as a gift i had no you idea you were 13 at the time i was young and i just could not get enough of it i mean i absolutely loved it from beginning to end and as it as it goes on there this is an album that stands the test of time i put it in the same division as like check your head by the beastie boys for example just timeless it's an album that you can absolutely listen to from beginning to end. It offers up jazz. It offers up hip hop energy. If you, for, for lack of a better way to, to describe it, you know, flea is an incredible musician. They even have, you know, tr their own tributes to Louis Armstrong and, you know, and, and various, tr uh, you know, horn, uh, action on that album. Robert and, uh, with, uh, Robert Johnson, yeah, they they did a, they did a Robert Johnson cover long before I ever knew who Robert Johnson was. Um, and uh, you know, it obviously bears mentioning it's produced by Rick Rubin. I think the first time he he worked with them, and you know, that I think uh, getting a little guidance and a little production out of uh, out of him changed that band's world. They went from being, as Roger mentioned earlier, a Los Angeles local band to maybe one of the biggest. I mean, they're 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 like you too big. I would think is that a fair statement? I yeah. mean, every time I say that or think that, it makes me weirded out because yeah, a small funk yeah. band in Los Angeles that nobody took that seriously. The shows were a lot of fun. And you thought of them as just being, you know, a bunch of goofballs making a racket, you know, and yeah. they, they weren't serious as punk and they weren't. No, but I mean, like, but they're, but they, they also represented some, some kind of freedom that I think a lot of people <laughs> latched on to rather than in, in some respect, it was, it was, uh, Anthony Kiedis made it allowed, made it, it okay for, you know, a, a middle school kid to freak out a little bit. You know, I mean that it was a the album had incredible mass appeal, but it's it's also incredible, incredibly put together, and even even the the album art and this Chili Peppers symbol, the asterisk, that was it's it's so perfectly Gen X, you know, it really it really it really felt it really landed in a pocket of emotion for Generation X in a special way, if you ask me. I mean, I. The title was was a little daring and edgy at the time, you know. What I mean, blood, sugar, sex, magic, Roger. We're gonna, you know. But the songs were fucking phenomenal. I could have lied. I can listen to that song over and over and it's over so again, fucking good. And, and and did, yeah. And I did, you know. Yeah. Uh, even even the the title track, "Blood Sugar Sex Magic," is oh. is amazing. My, my, my psycho favorite. sexy. Sir Psycho Sexy is just, I mean, I would listen to that thing and just sing it back word for word as loud as I could, you know? He just had his darkest as, as a sexual pervert. And that well, was, no, that was, it's, I was just reading it. That's, he intended that to be. That was him extrapolating all of his darkest, carnal, like, womanizing element that he was going through in his head. And he felt like he was, that's breaking the girls about too. Yeah. I'm going for women like fucking you know that like song is uh, is an unbelievable fucking song so one thing that i really noticed about um blood sugar sex magic is just the way they sequence the songs where they would be doing like something really funky and like extended like instrumentals and then they would go into like breaking the girl which has like that doesn't sound like anything else on the album and just and then they would go back into i'm looking at the track that's like funky monks so like you'd have like fruchante and 
flea just like slamming it out. And the drums are awesome too, by the way. Uh, Chad Smith, who's a really awesome drummer. It, it also, it you also got to mention that, I mean, uh, I had read that Kitas had just become sober because of the death of Halal mm-hmm. Slavic. He was freaked out and he wrote under the bridge, which obviously we've, we, we've heard that song once or twice. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, if you think about it, that song was so personal to him. I mean, I also read that he couldn't even perform it for a lot of years. I think I read that. I think I read back at some point that Ruben, Rick Ruben actually saw the lyrics written down and asked him about it. And and he is like said that he didn't consider it a song or he didn't really consider lyrics. Um, I don't know what he was just, he said, this is not a poem in his mind or whatever. And Ruben was the one that had to convince him to actually try to, to record it, put it to music, which is interesting. Yeah, he said that this is not for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And Rick Rubin's like, why? He's like, well, we don't do this. We don't do this. And he's like, well, why don't you? And he kind of like, you know, like to Pete's point, Rick Rubin was kind of getting the most out of these guys that, you know, he was able to harness their, uh, you know, their maximize their capabilities. You know, I don't think the, 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 you know, when you listen to the older Red Hot Chili Pepper stuff, which I like, uh, but it just, it has like a different production quality. It has a different song structure. Like they were really doing something uh, different. And on this record, uh, they're doing, they, you know, they're heading in another direction, but um, uh, well, go ahead, Roger. I mean, it was said at the time in the early records, which I prefer, even though they're of lesser quality and they are, the thing was they never could quite capture their live experience on a record live i mean that band was fearless completely deranged you know they of course would come out with socks on their dicks and uh, socks on their cocks as they'd call it or just flea would be just completely fucking naked um they would you know they they were anarchy they would open up for every band under the planet i saw them a million times opening up or or headlining with a bunch of you know from Minutemen to a fire hose and meat puppets and whoever came through town you know they became like Jane's Addiction was for a while, like the household band that you saw them. And so we, we you know, me and my friends, you know, we we loved uh, Freaky Styley and Uplift Mofo Party Plan, even though they're juvenile, um, not very introspective, and you know, the party boys filled with heroin. You know, that was it was that was their thing. Although we were all into cocaine at the time, heroin comes later. But the um, thing was, um, you know, they they had this certain. I mean, Hillel. You know, it's, no doubt Frashante is their best guitar player technically. There's no doubt. I mean, no, nobody would argue that. But Hillel, in his sort of spiritedness and his love for funk and his love, you know, uh, for jazz and funk, was able to kind of elicit a just, just bouncier, energetic sound that I was really into. And then, you know, Mother's Milk starts with the, with the metal with Frashante coming up mother's milk the album becomes more of a metal ish record right that was like their run from punk to sort of this metal sound and introducing the first ballad that they would ever sing you know uh and then boom the next album they introduce like fucking four or five ballads to then they became a ballad band <laughs> somewhere down the road in my opinion as they become more and more famous you know regular like that shit I don't when know. you mentioned hillel when hillel uh died they also oh. lost their original drummer who was a guy called jack irons and the interesting thing about jack irons was Recru- he was not only was he the original drummer for the red hot chili peppers he also met this guy uh who was pumping gas somewhere i don't know if it was san diego or la and his name was eddie, eddie vetter and eddie vetter had a tape of his vocals and Jack Irons gave it to his friends who were in a band that was looking for a singer. And uh, that actually became Pearl Jam. So he helped connect those guys, the band with the singer, but also Jack Irons actually wound up playing with uh, Pearl Jam for a couple of years because uh, Pearl Jam had a issue maintaining drummers for uh, various reasons. So that's a interesting, uh, you know, Jack Irons uh, occupies a pretty uh, interesting piece of rock and roll history, uh, late 80s, early 90s. 
Again. Roger, Roger, not to be confused with Jeremy Irons. No, not <laughs> <laughs> the the actor, the British actor, I believe. Yes. Is he British? Yes. yes. I think <laughs> they're certainly not the same uh, family. Uh, yeah, Jack Irons and Cliff Martinez was uh, uh, the drummer on the original album, the first Red Hot Chili Peppers album. And Cliff Martinez went on to be a film composer. He did the music for the movie um, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. So it was quite a weird, and he did Spring Breakers and Contagion and Traffic and Solaris for him. And he did the movie Drive, you know, with Nicholas Wayne and Reffin. So the Chili Peppers, you know, uh, he played with Captain Beefheart too. The Chili Peppers have gone through a few drummers that went on to become famous for other things as well before they landed on the guy who'd become their permanent and probably who? most but who drummed on blood sugar was, it, was that uh no, chad? Was chad. Yeah, chad. Chad, chad was, was, so chad's been there since then really yeah. right i think he was on mother's milk too yeah i think him and oh, chad, they came okay. together on mother's milk and he also plays with sammy hagar's bands kevin i know that you're a big fan of sammy's uh latter day work yeah i know and him and his tequila just really top notch <laughs> kevin you saw um the Red Hot Chili Peppers play overseas, didn't you? It was a pretty good show, right? I've seen them. I've seen them three times. Um, first time, I believe, was up in Seattle. No, the first time actually was in uh, was in Madrid. It was my first time in Europe, so it was about twenty three years old. This is nineteen ninety four, and I've just gotten to uh, Madrid at the end of my trip because I was thinking about possibly staying and living there at that time. And my first day in town, I. Uh, see a, a poster for the chili pepper concert in like five days or something. And, and, and I immediately got, go to a tourist office, try to figure out where I can get a ticket. They could direct me to a record store. I had my long hair going at that time. And I walk in, walk up to the counter and this young Spaniard looks at me and says, red hot chili peppers. And I was like, yes, dude, tell me you have a ticket. I have ticket. I was like, fuck yeah. So I go to the show by myself. Old bullfighting arena. So it's the concrete, you know, seat steps. And uh goddamn, who is the horrible freaking band that opened? Uh it'll come to me. I I have to think of it because like it made no sense that this band was opening for them. Anyway, I always say that if if, if you're pressed on like that. <laughs> no, I wish. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I, this is one horrible song that's eluding me. Whatever. Um, I, I just sat by myself up in the stand. I had a little. I just got from Copenhagen there. I had a little bit of weed left, so I saved it for like five days. Fashioned a freaking you know toilet paper roll aluminum foil pipe for myself and uh, smoked like right during the intermission. And then I just made my way through the crowd. And I was about five deep, thinking I'd be the one of the few that would understand Kedis and. You know, talking to the talking in English and these fuckers, of course, I, I doubt I don't know if they're fluent in Spanish, but they're fluent enough that every time they address the crowd, they're speaking Spanish. So I was actually the from, one asking from this. LA. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of people from LA that don't necessarily speak Spanish. Um, but I had the Spaniards translate for me. Like, what, what, what are they to say? They said they played the song for the Bulls. But the most amazing thing was I've never experienced anywhere, and it only, only would have happened in Europe because they played the show. They break, they do their encore, the encore is over, the concert is over. The lights are on, the roadies are breaking down the stage. I mean, and this never happens in the States. In the States, when those lights come on, people are, you know, I don't care how much they're crying, they want more. Those lights come on, people are done, and they know it's over. And these Spaniards were not budging. There had to have been a beast, you know, I don't know, 40, 50,000 people in this bullfighting arena. And I'm up front and I, and I got a freaking, I, I just want to get out because I got to pee so fucking bad. I've been holding it for this whole goddamn concert. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, people, this concert is over. And this is actually a one hot minute tour. So it was with uh, Navarro as freaking their it's guitarist. Okay. It's obviously probably everybody's the least favorite album, but it was that tour. And uh, <laughs> these Spaniards are just not, relenting they are just cheering screaming and after about 10 freaking 15 minutes i don't know how long 
you see the four of them appear behind the stage at the very top of the stadium and they just start running, jumping on these concrete, you know, steps back then. The place just goes fucking nuts, as you would expect. And they played like two or three more songs. And I've never seen that in any show in my life where, you know, the show is fucking over, man. And these crowd, these crowd just, they, these Spaniards willed, willed <laughs> some more songs into existence. That's awesome. Well, I think that probably talks to the power of uh, the music, man, that um, not only is this uh, a U.S. Uh, phenomenon, but uh, a global phenomenon. And um, I didn't see it. A lot of people are talking about this Woodstock 99 documentary, which, quite frankly, I don't really have too much of an interest in. But I, if I'm not mistaken, weren't the Red Hot Chili Peppers the headliners for that show? Yeah. Well, one of the one of the nights they were for sure. Yeah, and I remember in that's when they wore the light bulbs on their head. Yeah, I remember that, and uh, I remember that yeah. Ke- Keita said they took a helicopter out of there and they just turned around and like everything was on fire. And they're like, "Okay, uh, I think the '90s are over now." Was that 1999? I believe like that, that was 1999. Yes. Yeah, and by that time, I think there was a major difference between uh, 1991 and 1999. Yeah, those new metal kids came aboard and fucked those guys. Yeah, I think that you know Kevin, well, Kevin had a, Kevin was burning a hole in the Limp Biscuit CD those days. Oh uh, yeah, I just think that. Hey, the, co- sorry, sorry, real quick. Collective Soul. That's who opened that fucking <laughs> concert in Madrid. <laughs> Collective Soul. I was like, how does that happen? How does was it just a European tour? Collective Soul was fucking opening for the Chili Peppers. I can't I'm, believe that they opened for the Peppers in the states anywhere. That would have been. I mean, it would have been ridiculed. I, I, I'll never understand how they were the fucking opening band to that show. I was dragged to one time to see something so awful. I don't even want to talk about it. It was something very similar to that, and I just wanted to die. No, now you have to, Roger. Just Roger, say take us out. Roger, take us. We've been talking about good music. Take us out yeah. with some bad music. Yeah. Hey, Roger, was it was it a was it one night only with Fred Durst? Was it a one man show? I, the crash I, test dummy. Um, what's the, the goddamn band? It's like, like, like nineteen ninety seven, Matchbox Twenty. Oh God! Oh, oh yes, Twenty. I so um, I was kind of seeing my friend uh, Ralph's sister for a minute. We're hanging out. We're buddies, you know. Kind of, you know, whatever. And she worked for you know. I got to meet Alanis Morissette through her. I got to see the Family Values tour, which did fucking include Limp Biscuit, unfortunately. But it also had Rammstein, which was kind of cool. But the the I went to go see Avalon Theater in Chicago to see Matchbox Twenty with her, and for that I made her go with me to go see R.L. Burnside the next week because I just I needed a palate cleanser after that. I I was so miserable. I wanted to. I I could not. I wanted to die. And did Burnside did Burnside do the Sopranos theme? I got to know real quick. No, he does a song at the end Uh, of. I oh. know who Burnside is. Yeah. I'm saying, did he do the Sopranos theme oh, song? It's A3, Alabama 3. Oh, okay. The, uh, the, but he does have a song at the end of one episode called Shuck Dub. And he goes, check them all. I could listen to R.L. Burnside all day. I love that. Music. That music would trigger for me. Um, I'm telling you, uh, yeah, fuck Matchbox Twenty. Fuck all that shit. Fuck Goo Goo Dolls. Fuck. Hey, Roger. Roger, we can we we'll drive around the town and let the cops chase us around. Okay. Wow. Well, I think we've gone off the. Re- we we've strayed from the path a little bit, but what I would recommend is that everyone uh, listening here do yourself a favor. Uh, dig up these records. You could get them in um, basically any format. But, you know, probably Spotify, Apple Music. Uh, it's crazy how much time and it, the three of us or the four of us probably had to decide which record we wanted to buy that day. And that was uh, I've read a couple of uh, retrospectives about September 24th, 91. And like, you know, a lot of kids had to make a big decision on what they were going to buy that day. But um you know, now you can listen to all this stuff uh, at any time. And I would recommend that you do that. And I would recommend that you hit the like button, the subscribe button, leave us a comment. We really appreciate everyone listening to us uh, nerd out here a little bit tonight. And- real quick, George, real quick. I just got to ask Roger, what is 
just real that you have one second to answer this question. What's the best Jeremy Irons picture of all time? Reversal of fortune. Okay, good. Go ahead, George. And uh, on that note, I'm going to ask you to open the door very slowly. Uh, Pete, please uh, tap the citrus, and we'll see you on the next $5 hey, bus. Dead ringers. Sorry, John Cron- David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers. Sorry, I amended that. Thank okay, you. No, okay, what was, okay, what was the description? Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you soon. On, Kevin, you'll be back soon for uh, another session, and uh, we look we appreciate your time tonight, sir. Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. It was a good one, guys. Thank you.